you uh, very much. So, um, delighted to be um, talking about this topic. Um, I'm going to, I mean, I have some uh, empirical details, but it's not one single uh, empirical case. Uh, and um, so I'm trying to make a, an argument which I'll draw on uh, various cases as I, as I go through. But um, just by way of introduction, I want to say a bit how I, how I got to be here. And partly, um, I want to display some of the responsibility for that onto Mandy, uh, who's speaking next, who mentioned that, uh, well, you know, when she saw the program, she said, well, didn't I have a, a paper uh, that was roughly around these kind of topics? And uh, so then I said, well, I, I did. And I was delighted that somebody had seen it. Uh, and so I thought that maybe I should uh, volunteer something. And really, when I um, authored the, the paper, or when I first gave the sort of spoken version of it and then uh, turned it into a written paper, um, I was addressing a group of environmental sociologists. And it was one of those events when um, people had decided that they're a bit familiar with everything that's going on in the field. You know, some people are doing surveys and they're continuing to do that. Some people are doing controversy case studies and they're continuing to do that. Um, so they had a meeting about kind of new perspectives. And so I wanted to say that I felt that the group of environmental sociologists uh, who have a, um, they don't really have a, um, a federation like we have 4S or EAST, uh, they meet really as part of the International Soci Sociological Association, um, I felt that they weren't doing enough uh, about uh, valuation and valuing and thinking about how claims about environmental value were made. So by way of introduction, I didn't think about this initially as a talk for this audience. Many of you will already be you know, ahead of the argument as I'm making it. Um, I made it for them, but I think there's some interest in some of the points uh, along the way. And so I want to start off with something which I guess that we all kind of agree and uh, uh, take for granted, but just to make sure we're all coming from the same place, which is that um, environmental economics and to some extent the, um, the sort of deviating verse which calls itself ecological economics, um, see themselves as trying to help the environment uh, by putting a price on it. That is, the argument is something like um, that there's a danger that environmental goods get overused precisely because they don't have a price on them. And I guess, you know, we're all familiar with this. The arguments were set out in a systematic uh, kind of way, uh, you know, through the 80s, uh, and they became the kind of orthodoxy. And so, the, you know, the, the argument is partly about um, the costs of uh, pollution and so on, you know, that, so that uh, the effects of pollution are uh, spread among the many, but the benefits of causing the pollution, whether by your car or by your factory, accrue to a few. So you need uh, economists to sort out that imbalance in the distribution of goods and bads. Uh, and then also with regard to uh, sort of natural capital, if you think about um, you know, mining coal or extracting oil, well, typically um, on the standard economic spreadsheet, there's no notion of the world having got poorer if you take oil out of the ground. So there's no negativeness associated with the extraction of it. The price of the extraction is simply whatever it costs you to get it out, and there's no economic um, marking of the fact that you've diminished the world's stock of oil. Of course, there are lots of arguments about, you know, every time we try to make a guess about how big that stock is and when we've reached peak oil and so on, uh, we keep getting that wrong. But there is something to the argument that if you extract something, well, then there's something that's no longer there that used to be there. And that's why the ecological economics people want to bring in all this kind of discussion of uh, entropy into their economic models. So um, you have really for um, three decades or so now this kind of um, widely rehearsed, widely familiar argument about economists wanting to help the environment uh, by putting a price on it. And as I said, these are the standard moves, you know, to do with um, 
externalities uh, and the loss of natural capital. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me about this, sorry, I've used an invisible font. I don't know how that happened. It, it was, so this says, helping by pricing, acceptance in policy and NGOs. So um, when these arguments were first being made, um, I remember this actually helped me in a job interview because I was being interviewed by a pro vice chancellor who was an economist. And he was kind of surprised that a sociologist had ever read uh, any of these kind of, uh, kind of things. And he just chatted to me through the whole uh, interview. Um, but I remember a around this time when I was doing work with environmental organizations, there was a lot of uh, resistance to these ways of thinking about the environment. So in Friends of the Earth and so on, they were very interested in the way in which the um, Treasury, the Finance Ministry in the UK, was picking up these arguments, but they didn't want to have anything to do with them themselves. So they, you know, it was a, a, a source of interest, but something they didn't want to do. But by 2013, we have this uh, book, which um, I suspect many of you will know. Tony Juniper is a well-known um, British ecologist. Uh, he was for a while um, leader of campaigns and then for a relatively short time a director of Friends of the Earth. Uh, he's a big friend of Prince Charles and so on. And he has this very nice book, uh, What Has Nature Ever Done For Us? I mean, that obviously picks up on the Monty Python, you know, uh, what have the Romans ever done for us kind of idea. Um, and it has this very smart um, subtitle, you know, how money really does grow on trees. Um, but in this book, so, you know, 20 years later on, the, the person who in some sense is the... Um, voice for environmental organizations such as Friends of the Earth has come round to the idea that this is actually quite a valuable way uh, of thinking about uh, these issues, to think about the services and systems um, that are provided to us uh, through nature. And then, of course, uh, as everyone here will know, uh, very famously, Nicholas Stern, uh, you know, I mean, as it were, the great thing that Nicola Stern achieved was turning climate change uh, into a, an issue which uh, economists might worry about and think about themselves as having a role in solving. So, you know, very famously in uh, one of his um, Economic Institute lectures, he made this claim here, which is very widely circulated, which climate change is a result of the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. Um, I mean, there's been some resistance about that. You know, well, how, how exactly do you measure the greatest market failure that the world has ever seen, and so on. But essentially making the, uh, the claim that, well, we need to worry about climate change because it is exactly the kind of thing that economists are well equipped to worry about. It's a market failure. Uh, here's a big problem that's accruing without anybody having the responsibility of addressing it. And of course, his uh, famous solution is to say, well, you know, if you think climate change is going to be very expensive to fix, and of course it is, well, think about what, you know, if it's going to be a trillion dollars to fix it, or two trillion dollars to fix it, well, how much is that really? And he's, you know, he says, well, that's just the typical increase in the world's GDP. So if you fix it, you've just slowed down progress by one year. That wasn't so hard, was it? You know, so that's the kind of, that, that's how he gets the, the argument in there. Uh, and of course, uh, this kind of framing gets taken up in policies. So um, in the UK, this is very much uh, through a bunch of publications uh, associated with an economist called David Pierce, who was influential in government circles, uh, and uh, he had you know, the first book was called Blueprint for a Green Economy, and then there was Blueprint 2 and Blueprint 3 uh, and Blueprint 4. Yes, you guessed it. Um, now, so I, you know, I guess we're all sort of there. Uh, this is the background to these issues. So we've got this um, wide acceptance that it makes sense to think about climate uh, in these terms. Uh, and increasingly, people are thinking about um, ecosystem services and biodiversity uh, in the, the same terms. 
So one of the things that got me interested in this in the, the first place was this whole language of thinking about the value or the worth uh, of um, biodiversity in terms of the ecosystems uh, services which it can provide. And you can see, you know, with Tony Juniper, for example, how he wants to go into this. You know, he celebrates all the fantastic work that bees do for us in pollination services. And he says, you know, think how much it would cost to perform those pollination services without the bees, for example. You know, and there are cases where there's been decline in bee services and you either have to pay someone to bring in bees or you have to pay people to go around and do with you know, little paintbrushes uh, the work that the bees would otherwise be doing and you can see that there is a, you know, a genuine academic, uh, economic cost uh, to those things. But I was interested in that kind of discursive move to turn a concern for biodiversity uh, into a concern for the satisfaction of ecosystem services. So in um, the 15 minutes or so uh, that remain uh, for me to talk about this, I just want to go through um, a bunch of, uh, sorry, I've got four headings here. These are things that it seems to me in, uh, whether in the literature or in terms of uh, controversies that are arisen or in terms of what environmental organizations have highlighted uh, some of the concerns about them. So they're about the appropriateness of this framing, the generalizability, uh, and then a, a couple of things which are less um, at the level of principle but are to do with the way in which it's done. So one is to do with making markets and the other is to do with the kind of hidden work behind pricing and selling. Okay, so appropriateness. So appropriateness is really this issue of whether it is a kind of, um, you know, a good idea to recast these environmental problems uh, in these terms or whether there's some kind of categorical mistake uh, in doing this. Now, when you look at Tony Juniper, you know, although um, the blurb on the cover of the book makes it sound as though the book is very buys into these kind of arguments about wholly recasting environmental uh, goods as environmental services. One of the things that, that you know, he rather skillfully in the book tries to do is to ride a line between saying, you know, it's helpful to understand how important these services are, but that's not my only reason for being concerned about this. So he kind of uh, hedges the issues around appropriateness, um, you know, in a textual way during the course of the book. But you do have these bigger arguments about is price the right register for thinking about these things uh, in the, the first place. So that you know, people will say, well, yes, you know, clearly the natural world does provide services to us, it provides benefits to us, and it may occasionally be beneficial to think about what the, the value of those services are, but that is really a kind of rhetorical argument for getting people to appreciate the ubiquity and the significance of what these services do. It's not really how we want to value those services. And there's a kind of a, a concern about, you know, the more successful you are in making that argument, or the more you pin your colors to that kind of uh, economic argument, the more you're losing any other place to go in terms of the kind of values that you want to attach uh, to the environment. So you get these arguments which I guess in many people's mind are associated with uh, 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 Michael Sandel, you know, the, the, the well-known philosopher who's interested in these things about, you know, which things should be um, properties of the market and which things should not. Um, he's very famous, you know, for um, one of those, uh, one of the examples that he uses that's become very well known is, you know, um, people like me uh, are often uh, on the edge of being late to collect their children uh, from kindergarten. Um, so some, um, some kindergarten started saying, well, if your parents are persistently late, we're going to fine you. But then people turned the fine into a way of saying, well, if it only cost me 10 pounds, I might as well just stay in the meeting. 
Okay? So then, when they started to impose the fines, people turned up later, more often, because it was no longer, you know, it was no longer a moral shame that they turned up late. They were just paying the price for having the, the staff have to work there a bit longer. Um, so you get that, that question that, you know, by introducing a charge, you, you're suddenly changing the basis on which the estimation is made. It moves from a moral thing to a thing which is categorized in terms of value, monetary value, and then once you have that, well, you can then make other trade-offs. You know, if I'm going to earn more in overtime, then I'm going to lose by uh, having to pick Sammy, not my child's name, uh, up from kindergarten, then, um, you know, that might be, might be worth doing. Now, of course, there is also a, 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 a concern that typically uh, comes from the, uh, the more um, ecological or um, biological sciences side, which is to say that um, using expressed or revealed prices, depending on what kind of methods you do to work out the price of something or other, um, there's, a, there's a danger that that bifurcates away from expert understandings of what the importance of things in an ecological context really is. So that uh, if you say, well, let's think about the value of some insects or uh, of um, bird species, or if you think about you know, the, the value of whales to the uh, tourist industry in the Azores, if you think about it in those terms, well, then you don't necessarily pick up on the issues which are actually, according to biologists or ecologists, most critical to the survival of the networks which, the biological networks which supports these forms of life. So you can end up with a divergence between what experts take as important and, which, and the things which are taken by users or customers or businesses to be the important and salient things of the environment. So you get a danger there of a mismatch. Now, a third concern here uh, is also that uh, the price can go against you. Um, that is, imagine that you go down the route of saying, well, um, we value bees because of their pollination services, and that becomes your primary argument about why you ought to do bee conservation. You know, obviously bee conservation has become a big issue uh, in the context of the EU, but it's also huge uh, in the United States, and you know, we have uh, anthropology of bees as a big thing in Edinburgh. Um, but th there is a way in which you could be tempted to think, well, this is gonna be such a winning argument for conserving bees because of all the pollination services they provide. But of course, that's taking a bet on the fact that there couldn't be some kind of Amazon drone that itself does pollination services. So if the pollination service is the thing that you value, a commercial enterprise that comes along with a cheaper pollination services could undercut bees, okay? You know, just say, well, bees are so 20, 2010, we don't need bees any longer, we can provide all the pollination services much more quickly and much more effectively, then your, your argument, you know, it's a, um, a sort of self-destruct argument. And of course, this, this concern was also raised with regard to um, the Stern review about climate change, saying, well, you know, it was lucky that it worked out, wasn't it? Because if it had turned out that well, climate change, yeah, that's going to cost a lot, but fixing it, that's going to cost way more. Well, then the, the obvious implication would have been, oh, we better just put up with it then, because it will cost much more to fix it than the harms that will likely result. You know, so the, there was a sense in which, you know, um, George Monbiot was uh, an interesting uh, exponent of this, said, you know, we don't want to go that way, because imagine what would have happened if the calculations had come out the other way. And of course, you do then get all these big arguments about you know, the tendentiousness of the discount rate and so on in the Stern Review, meaning that it was kind of fixed, some critics would say. OK, so there are all these issues around appropriateness. Um, now, I think there are also interesting issues about generalizability. I've just got one example here, which you won't be able to read very easily, and also because uh, it, there's a big quote and I didn't want to try and put it all onto 
uh, one slide. So I'm just going to read it here, and my machine has locked me out, so I'm just going back in. Um, should have used paper. Um, but so this um, is the UK, um, the uh, Millennium um, Ecosystem Assessment. So the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment that was produced using this kind of uh, methodology for trying to work out um, the, uh, the services which uh, the UK ecosystem provided uh, to people in the UK and beyond. Okay, so this is the synthesis report that came out in 2011. And um, I just need to, to read this because it's so, it's so beautiful and bonkers at the same time. Okay, so quote, Environmental settings play a positive role in religious practice and faith, but more general evidence on their spiritual and religious role is limited. You don't say. It, okay. And then, religious and spiritual goods are clearly linked to our existence need for being. Okay. I don't know where Mark's got in here, but so our existence need for being. But the extent to which religious encounters with specific environmental settings are synergistic satisfiers for value needs, such as participation and identity, resides in the character and character of belief. So, I don't quite understand that, but I think it means how good an environment is for satisfying your spiritual needs depends on what your spiritual beliefs are. Okay. Um, the importance of ecosystems in religious terms had almost certainly increased in the post-war period in Britain, notwithstanding secularization and the decline of conventional religious observance. So people are becoming more sort of uh, naturistic in their uh, practices. There has apparently been an increase in the incidence of both pilgrimage and of religious retreats, although it is extremely difficult to identify any quantitative measures of this trend. They finish, it is extremely hard to pinpoint evidence of particular landscapes or ecosystems being conducive to religious experiences. Okay, so what I thought was beautiful and obviously insane about this was the, how seriously they taken this. That is, they wanted to find, you know, they said, well, obviously one of the things, so one of the categories is cultural value that arises from uh, ecosystems. Uh, and so they, they say, well, obviously part of the cultural value is religious or spiritual value, but then, oh dear, it's rather difficult to put a numerical value on that. Um, and you know, we don't quite know which particular ecosystems are conducive to producing spiritual value. I mean, presumably, you, know, you could have more spiritual value if you, if you found out there was water meadows and you had more water meadows or fields of daffodils, or whatever it would be. Um, so there is this question about generalizability. You can see that you know, in these ecosystem assessments, what they've tried to do is to think of all of the kinds of values that can be contributed by the environment. But then, in order to make that work methodologically, they have to come up with quantitative assessments, ways of counting those, and ways of working out if you know, the spiritual value has declined or increased, what kind of ecosystems need to be protected in order to boost the, uh, e the religious uh, values uh, that are being provided. Now, the third thing that I'd like to say a tiny bit about is uh, realizing markets. Now, um, um, clearly, Donald McKenzie uh, you know, is all over all of this area, but he's done a particular uh, uh, lot of work about this. Um, Suffice it to say that the people who don't follow this, um, I mean, who don't follow the prices, I mean, so one of the interesting things is the um, Europe, the European Union was a leader in introducing uh, an actual carbon market. So the idea that people who needed to have carbon emissions from their, their boilers, I mean, in Donald's famous example, uh, or uh, from their uh, large combustion plant for you know, producing power, uh, electrical power, for example, or from a, a, a big plant in a factory. They need to have uh, carbon emissions, and if they don't have enough permits, they go to the market and buy them. 
the hope was that the price of carbon was going to go up and up and up, uh, forcing people without government intervention to be more uh, thrifty in their emissions of carbon dioxide. But if you look back to the beginning of the uh, European trading system, you find that even this year, the value per tonne has only gone back to where it was when it started. So after 12 and a half, 13 years, you know, there's been no squeezing of carbon dioxide emissions as a result of this market. We're only now back to where we were at the start. Uh, and of course, that was partly because, unluckily, we, you know, in lots of ways, uh, we had the recession straight afterwards, so that uh, uh, there was a lot less interest in kind of enterprises which were likely to cause uh, carbon emissions, so the market didn't work because factories were closing. Um, but also because when the market was set up, um, essentially the European member states wanted to protect the interests of their domestic producers. So they, produ they, at the start of the market, they gave lots of permits. And nearly everybody said, oh no, we're, we're going to need much more than that. So their governments you know, then tried to secure more permits for their industry everybody gave in a little bit, and there was therefore a big oversupply of permits uh, in, the, in the market from the start. So although the market was supposed to uh, sort of endogenously solve this, th there was never any shortage of permits, and there wasn't a well um, articulated mechanism for withdrawing permits from the market. So it, it had very little taming effect. Um, now, of course, the other things that are interesting about this, uh, two things that I mentioned at the bottom, is one is emergent market opportunities. Once you've created a market in something, I mean, that is, the basic idea in this case is that you have a market in something and you try to reduce the amount of permits to produce the carbon dioxide within the market, and that forces people to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. But, of course, other businesses within the markets can then appear, like you can have a futures market uh, in carbon dioxide emissions. You can have speculations on where the market is going to go in the future. So that one of the things that is often not anticipated in these designs is people's um, creative responses to the opportunities that the market provides, which by definition didn't exist until the market was invented as an institution. And some of those are, you know, things like offsetting and so on, industries that operate within the space that the market provides. You know, if there isn't a market, you can't really talk about offsetting. I mean, you might persuade people morally that they should offset, but you could also do offsetting within the context of a, an actual market in emissions. But of course, you can also do things that are, let's say, crooked or smart, depending on how you look at it. Um, so one of the things that uh, came up in the about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, but has also been a continuing problem, um, is that it turns out that um, quite by accident, um, some gases which are big uh, carbon um, greenhouse gases. Um, can attract a lot of payment for their destruction. So there are gases, I mean, the, the one that's most notorious is HFC 23, which is uh, trifluoromethane. So it's like methane gas, but just with the uh, three of the hydrogens knocked off and fluorine put in its place. And that has a, a staggeringly huge uh, global warming potential compared to carbon dioxide, like 11,000 times per, by weight. So you want to get rid of that. And this was often produced not, I mean, some people produce it intentionally as a, a, a retardant, flame retardant, but it's also produced accidentally as a byproduct of producing other um, coolant, um, you know, so uh, other permissible HCFCs. And then it, people realized that although they're producing it as a byproduct, they were actually earning much more for destroying it 
than they were for producing the thing of which it was the byproduct. So, um, and then developed countries under the clean development mechanism, which was part of the Kyoto arrangements, could pay for carbon dioxide or global warming to be offset in other places. So you find out that there's a factory in China or India that is accidentally producing uh, this uh, hydrofluoride as a byproduct of something. It has a huge global warming potential. You can pay them, you can enable them to destroy it and thus reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. And so you get credits under the clean development mechanism. But unfortunately, this provides a perverse incentive to carry on producing the thing because you earn vastly more from making the thing and destroying it than from actually making the, the other product, the HCFC, that was supposed to go in the uh, deep freezes and the cooling mechanism, which was still allowed uh, in, under the Montreal Protocol at the time. And this, I mean, the 2015 paper comes out saying this is still carrying on in Russia and the Ukraine, that they are essentially producing things which they maintain are byproducts which they then have to destroy, but all of the earning comes from the destruction of the byproduct and none of it from the product itself. So this is an example of something that is, you know, it wouldn't have been an issue but for the market. The market produces behaviors which are rewarded by the market and they turn out to be in some ways worse than not having a market at all. Then, final thing that um, I'm interested in here uh, is the way in which um, it's often assumed that, you know, well, the, the key thing is to work out, you know, these, um, the kind of in principle arguments, you know, that we should think about environmental problems as externalities or as natural capital. And once you've got that sort of paradigm change, uh, then you're on the road to solving these problems. Or maybe what you need to do is an institution, like set up the market in the right way. Um, but of course, one of the other issues is that the market itself depends on inputs. That is, if you're going to have a market, um, I mean, the market in uh, um, greenhouse gases, for example, you need to have an inventory of all the kinds of emissions that come from particular countries. If you're thinking about trying to do something similar with ecosystem services, well then you need to have a good inventory of the different habitats and biomes that exist in various countries. And of course, these things get produced not by economists, but they get produced by you know, government ecologists or government biologists who go around doing a classification of habitat types. So there's actually a lot of um, scientific and classificatory work that goes on in producing, you know, so one of the cases that I, I looked into, not for this reason, uh, for, for other reasons, but I, I became interested in was the classification of peat bogs. Uh, I was interested in arguments about the conservation value, but you know, essentially people had to go around and record you know, what percentage of Northern Ireland was covered in different kinds of peat bogs and which ones were the most valuable for conservation purposes and so on. And all of that work was subject to contestation and argument. But of course all that lies behind what goes into the founding of these figures because in order to make these markets you need to know you know, what kinds of terrains or what kinds of gases or what kind of greenhouse potentials are there in the first place. Okay, so just to um, summarize, um, when I was making this kind of, um, the argument of this paper in the first place, you know, I was talking to environmental so sociologists and saying, look, very often we're not paying attention to the ways in which values are constructed. You know, so environmental sociologists are often, they're a bit worried about economists coming in, do we really want to talk about things in terms of externalities or not? And what I was trying to say is, well, sort of with an STS head on, you, you get to ask these questions, not just about is that a good idea, but where are the, you know, how are these market factors made? 
How are prices generated? How are these things operating? And in the context of that, I think these four issues about you know, appropriateness, about generalizability, does it apply to everything? Um, how does a market actually work and what kind of emergent initiatives or incentives come out of the existence of a market? And then finally, about the sort of bureaucratic and classificatory processes that inevitably underlie recognizing things as being the same or different in the first place. You know, so is this peatland the same as that one, or do they get categorized as different kinds of activities? So I think I'll leave it there. I've slightly overrun my time, but I'm still within 40 minutes, I think. Thank you very much.